So I want to begin with a question. I want you to think with me. Who is truly blessed? That's the question of the hour. Who is truly blessed? Now, answers to that question will undoubtedly vary depending upon what kingdom you are living in. In our right side up kingdom of America, if you were to ask a child, I suppose if I could transport myself to my living room and ask my boys, Aiden and Gavin, they would likely answer this question, who is truly blessed? And they would describe a person who has freedom and a person who's having fun. Dad, give me unlimited game time on the Xbox. Then I'll be blessed. Mom, give me another Coke or soda, pop, whatever you call it around here. Let me have that for lunch, and then I'd be blessed. If only the neighborhood kids could come out and play today, then we'd really be blessed. You see, for a child, blessedness is connected to the ability to do what you want, when you want. Now let's suppose for a moment we were to ask an adult. I'm sure we have a few that are watching. Who do you think is truly blessed? And notice that their answer would likely differ from that of a child. Many a grandparent watching this morning who might say, well, a person whose family is in good health, they are the ones who are blessed. Or they might reflect, no, a person who at this time has stable income. I mean, if you're a manager at Walmart, right? If you're employed by Amazon, if you're working for a pharmaceutical company or a respiratory mask producer, manufacturer, those people right now, they are blessed because they're stable income. Or perhaps they'd say, the ones who are truly blessed are the ones who are just able to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. And certainly there might be some measure of truth to that. So you ask a child and you get one answer. You ask an adult and you get a different answer. And I suppose that if we were to poll some of our young adults, who do you think is truly blessed? Their answer would be unique in and of itself. They might reply, a person who has friends. Or, or a person who has a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or perhaps a person who has a clear sense of direction and purpose in their life. You see, our right-side-up kingdom has shaped each one of us to believe that being blessed, I guess another way you could say that, flourishing. Our right-side-up kingdom has shaped us to believe that flourishing or blessedness is largely dependent upon experiencing the right set of external circumstances. Consequently, when life isn't going our way, circumstantially, we struggle to feel blessed, and we even entertain thoughts of being cursed. When we lack things, some external possession, when we lack funds, the capacity to do or get things, when we lack friends, people to enjoy our things with, then we might be a whole lot of things, but we're something less than blessed, or so it appears to us in our right-side-up kingdom. If we lack freedom, the ability to do occupationally what we want, 
or love who we want, or concerning personal identity, be what we want to be, then in our culture, we're being oppressed. And everybody knows the oppressed are not the ones who are blessed. If we lack success, whether that be financial, our 401k, our retirement, our possessions, our business, if we lack success relationally, God forbid a divorce, friction with our grown children, if we lack success religiously, failure to live up to the self-imposed standards or legalistic rules and restrictions that our little sect has prescribed for us. If we lack success, well then, we feel like failures. And we all know and can identify with the thought that being a failure is not quite what you're thinking of when you're thinking of what it means to be blessed. Our right-side-up kingdom, like any kingdom, has its own perception of what true blessedness is. And consequently, as a temporarily quarantined kingdom, many of us this morning feel like we're trending towards being increasingly cursed, and we're definitely something less than trending towards being blessed. Now, whether or not you are truly blessed in this kingdom can, if you think about it, seem to be completely subjective. Uh, it may, from your perspective, depend completely on who you are, what's going on in your life, who you're asking. But I want you to think with me this morning, those of you who are at home, what if our right side up kingdom is wrong? Right, let that hang there for a minute. Well, what if our kingdom's got it wrong? What if being blessed has nothing to do with external circumstances or subjective feelings? What if, even in America, the rich aren't necessarily the flourishing ones? What if, even for a young adult, the popular crowd isn't the crowd truly blessed? What if, in our vain, sex-driven world, beautiful people aren't truly the blessed people? And add to that, what if there existed in contrast to a subjective, fluctuating definition of blessedness, what if there existed an absolute, black and white, clear as day, definitive way of knowing whether or not, no matter how you felt, you were blessed? Would you want to know it? Would you? What if the pathway to being blessed went completely against everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever known, everything you've ever been taught in our right-side-up kingdom. Would you have the courage to walk the true pathway of being blessed? In Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 36, we're continuing our walk with Jesus and his disciples as they journey along the long road to Jerusalem. Luke, as he began to do in chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, is continuing to focus our attention upon Jesus' teachings. He's wanting us to remain in that posture of being like Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet, prioritizing what Jesus says. He's wanting to unfold for us 
in greater depth what exactly it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And as we listen in on Jesus' teachings today, we will hear him make another wildly controversial claim. It goes something like this. In his Father's kingdom, the upside-down kingdom, it's those who do not appear blessed that truly are blessed. That's a pretty bold claim. Jesus, through our teachings that we will listen in on today, reminds His disciples that in God's kingdom, His already but not yet kingdom, the blessed ones are not the ones that look to be blessed. The blessed ones are actually the ones who don't appear to be blessed. This is one of the reasons we call God's kingdom the upside-down kingdom. Now, why does this matter to any of us today? You're worried about toilet paper. You're wondering when frozen pizza will finally return to Meyer. Well, let me suggest for you a couple of answers. A couple of reasons. Number one, I'm assuming this morning that you desire, if you're tuned in this morning, you desire to be blessed. I'm just assuming, I think the Bible assumes this too, that, that every human wants to flourish. Therefore, I, I think this is a very relevant topic for us to consider this morning. Not just flourish eternally, but in our soul, each one of us desires individually, relationally, in whatever area you care to address this side of eternity, we long to be blessed. So number one, I think it matters because this is something we want. Number two, I think this matters. And listen to me carefully. Maybe, just maybe, what we are experiencing right now circumstantially in our right-side-up kingdom is better for us than what we might first tend to think. And here's what I'm suggesting. Maybe what God in His grace is doing globally and locally, maybe what God is doing is something better than what you for the last week or two have entertained to believe? What if God is stripping us of our false sense of blessedness? And what if in stripping us of our false saviors, God is drawing our attention to help us discover what true blessedness is all about. If that were true, if it were true that God is at work right now in your life to turn your attention from all of those things that really won't cause you to be blessed and to draw your attention back to the one thing that will result in blessedness, if that is truly what God is at work to do, then friend, you have every reason to rejoice today. You have no reason to worry or despair. In Luke 11, 14-36, Jesus teaches us who is truly blessed as He responds to three groups within His audience following an exorcism. And I want you to follow along with me as we begin in verse 14. Hopefully you got a Bible out. You're paying close attention. Follow with me as we work through the text. I'll be reading out of an ESV Bible. Verse 14. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. Notice how Luke very succinctly gives us our new setting. We're moving off the topic of prayer and onto the topic of Jesus' miracle working power. Yet, we, the reader, know that the two topics aren't completely unrelated. It wasn't that long ago that Jesus informed us and his disciples that there is a link between prayer and exorcism power. 
Now back to our text. Verse 14b. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. Pay close attention to how Luke quickly moves beyond the miracle. It's not really what he's concerned about. But rather, he focuses in for a moment on the crowd's response. And notice how Luke divides the crowd into three groups. Looking at the end of verse 14. And the people, group number one, the people marvel. Some people saw what Jesus did, and they were awestruck. Verse 15. But some of them said, this is a second group. Notice how they're characterized as being different. They're not struck with wonder. Notice what the text says. Here's what they're saying. This is slander. He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. That is a very strong and slanderous statement. We're not told how many were saying this, but we're told at least some. So you've got some people amazed, marveling. You've got other people rationalizing what they're seeing by attributing Jesus' exorcisms to being the work of Satan. And then you've got a third group of people. Look at verse 16. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. So there's a third group that's at least trying to posture themselves as being undecided. Right? They're neither Democrat nor Republican. They're independent. They're, they're fence-sitters. They're observing what Jesus is doing. They've seen some of the signs. Certainly they've seen this most recent sign, the casting out of the mute demon. And yet, what they're saying within themselves is, I need another sign. If you really want me to recognize your authority and follow you, I need another sign. I need more proof. Starting in verse 17, Luke's attention turns towards Jesus' response, his teachings. Jesus' response is recorded in verse 17 through 36, and he responds to each group within his audience. In Jesus' threefold response, he addresses each of their concerns and provides them with an authoritative statement concerning who is truly blessed. That is the structure of this text. You can find that by paying close attention to each time Luke tells us, Jesus said. You will find three, and Jesus said. Then there's some teaching. And Jesus said. And then there's some teaching. And Jesus said. And then there's some teaching. There are three groups that Jesus is addressing. We'll first consider his response to those who slandered him. That's verse 17 through 26. We're going to first consider how does Jesus respond to the group of people who are saying, you're doing what you're doing through the power of Satan. We're going to look at that. That's verse 17 through 26. And then we're going to skip a few verses. And secondly, we'll consider then his response to those who were unpersuaded by him. Remember this crowd? We need more miracles. You got to give me more proof. I haven't seen enough light yet to make a decision. And then finally, we're going to give attention to his response, which I think is really the focal point of the entire pericope. His response to the one who marvels in verse 27 and 28. And it will be there that definitively Jesus will describe for us who is truly blessed. So let's first look at the response of those who slandered him. The response of those who slandered him. So start listening along with me as we dive into verse 17. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, said to them who, and we'll find this at the, verse, at the end of verse 18, these are the people who are saying, you're doing what you're doing through the power of Beelzebul, which was a first century 
common name for Satan. You're doing what you're doing through the power of Satan. So he says to that group, in a defense or apologetic of what he's doing, he says, verse 17, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. So he first appeals to logic. Like, what you're saying I'm doing just doesn't make sense. He's suggesting in a kind way, you're an idiot. Verse 18. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Now, notice he moves from his first argument, just logical thinking, to another argument of clear, rational reasoning. Notice what he says in verse 19. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, what's happening here? On one hand, Jesus could be making a generic reference to other Jewish spiritual leaders who were able to exercise demons in the first century. And, and, and the argument would look like this. He's saying, well, uh, I'm able to cast out demons, so then are you also claiming that all of your fellow Pharisees who likewise have cast out demons, are you supposing that they must cast out demons by the power of Satan too? Are you suggesting that? Because if you're suggesting that, I think they would be in complete disagreement or they would stand in judgment against you. They'd disagree with you. But it's quite possible that what Jesus is doing here is pointing out the hypocritical fact that some of their very own exorcists were casting out demons through the use of Jesus' name. And we find that hinted at in Luke 9, 49. Remember the disciples come to Jesus? Hey, there's this guy over here. He's casting out demons in your name. And Jesus rebukes them, saying, hey, whoever is, whoever is for me, it's not against me. We find this also happening in the book of Acts in the ministry of Paul. Some, seeing the success of Paul at exercising demons, were, without being believers themselves, they were appealing to the name of Jesus whom Paul preached for the authority to cast out demons themselves. And then that I think makes the best sense of the next portion of verse 19. Therefore, they will be your judges. There's a lot of hypocrisy happening here. His answer to those who slandered him, I'm suggesting this morning, has three basic parts. And we begin to see these parts unfold in verse 20 all the way through verse 26. First, he explains that he exercises by the finger of God. Okay, so, so what Jesus is saying to this group of people who have been slandering him, he's told them that it's illogical. He's given them two reasons why it's illogical. But what Jesus is actively slaying to him in defense of himself is this. He's saying, I exercise by the finger of God. Look at verse 20. But if it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, Jesus' association with, and I quote, the finger of God, end quote, is very intriguing. In order to understand it, you have to know a little bit of the background or story behind it. The first person in Scripture to be recorded as doing something by the finger of God was Moses in the first Exodus, specifically Exodus 819. If you recall the story, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to mimic the first two miraculous acts of Moses' plagues, turning water into blood, drawing out frogs from the Nile. However, the third plague, turning dust into flies, they could not perform. So the magicians of Pharaoh say to Pharaoh, Exodus 819, this is the finger of God. And what that expression means is what Moses is doing, he's doing through the empowerment of God. 
But Pharaoh refused to listen. So, in the first exodus, Yahweh, the high king, was at work to plunder Pharaoh's kingdom and bring about his rule upon the earth through his covenant people. And a shocking twist in this unfolding story is that the unbelieving magicians of Pharaoh's court could clearly see that Moses' works were empowered by none other than God Himself. And yet, what the unbelieving magicians of Pharaoh could see, the Pharisees, like Pharaoh, through the hardness of their own hearts, are blinded to see. So he first explains that he exercises by the finger of God. Now second, he explains that he is therefore then ushering in the kingdom of God upon the earth. Now, he said that in verse 20, but notice how he unpacks that in verses 21 and 22. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. And the illusion here is that Satan, the god of this world, is a strong man. And he's been guarding his house, his kingdom. This right side up kingdom. But notice verse 22. When one stronger than he attacks him, who's the stronger one? Who's the mightier one? Well, this is Jesus himself, sent from God to bring about the kingdom of God upon the earth. When the one stronger attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted. And he divides his spoil. He loots and plunders the house. Jesus here is claiming to be the mightier man. Prophesied by John the Baptist, Luke 3, 16. Who has bound the strong man, Satan, so that his kingdom can now be plundered, so that Christ's spoils can now be taken, and so that His Father's kingdom can be established upon the earth. So Jesus is teaching the slanderers. And oh, what I hope you see this morning is this. What mercy. What mercy that He would even seek to teach the slanderers. Jesus is teaching the slanderers that He wants them to see that he exercises by the finger of God and that he has ushered in already the kingdom of God, though they've been unable as of yet to perceive it. And I want you to know, third and finally, under this first response of Jesus to the slandering ones, he explains that they, so long as they refuse to follow him, they are aligned against Him. And therefore, and this is a shocking twist, the very accusation that they have made towards Him, you're a servant of Satan, is actually what they themselves are in reality. And notice how he unpacks this in verses 23 through 26. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. Right? There's only two kingdoms. There's only two mighty men. And your allegiance is towards one of the kingdoms and one of those mighty men. And if you are not joining with him in the plundering of Satan's kingdom, then you are, whether you think it or not, you are actively working against him to scatter his spoils. There is no room for neutrality in the mind of Jesus. Now, notice where he goes in verse 24 through 26. This is a kind of a confusing passage. If you read the scriptures in advance, you probably got a little bit lost here. But I think it's really clear. Verses 24 through 26 summarize the end result of the Pharisaic exorcisms. And Jesus is challenging them through these verses of what actually is happening 
through their deliverance ministry to consider that their exorcisms are in the end really in league with Satan. Notice his description of their exorcisms. Verse 24, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. Okay, what does that mean? Demons love to occupy in some manner a host. And when you go to desert-like places, you don't find many people. So as the demons are cast out into the desert, a place often in Scripture being described as being the abode of demons, they're not able to find rest. Therefore, they say something like this, I'll return to my house from which I came. I'll go back to the person I once had control over. And then notice verse 25. And when they come back, what have they found? The house has been swept and it's been put in order. The person who was formerly possessed has improved. Their life has gotten a little bit better. But there's a problem. You see, through the ministry of the Pharisees, there was no abiding, new, powerful resident within that person's heart. So here's what happens. Seeing the house swept and in order, that demon goes, brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. This is what characterized exorcisms in the first century that were not a part of Jesus' exorcising work. For only Jesus could go beyond casting out the demon and impart the blessing of God's wonderful Spirit. In summary, Jesus is challenging those that would slander Him to see clearly. They aren't the blessed ones. The blessed ones are those who follow Jesus in looting Satan's kingdom and establishing that kingdom upon the earth. Blessedness, hear me, church. Blessedness is found in joining up with Jesus by engaging in His kingdom work. Now pay close attention. You've heard this before. In the Father's upside-down kingdom, it's those who do not appear blessed. I'm talking about the ones who have forsaken all and followed Jesus. I'm talking about the ones who have denied themselves and taken up a cross, and they're walking with Jesus down the long road of persecution and suffering. It's that remnant that are actually blessed. But it's the last group in the world that the right side up kingdom would acknowledge as being blessed. Now here's a question. What does this have to do with you? Well, I want you to think with me. I'm going to be Captain Obvious here. There's a whole lot of stuff we can't do right now, right? right? Kids who are watching can't go to school. Instead, you've got to stay home and do school. What could be worse? Mom and dad have to teach. This is hell on earth. Can't go to school. Some parents can't go to work. You are forced to stay in home with said kids and teach them this for you too. Hell on earth. Can't go to the mall. <coughs> can't go to the ball field. Can't go to the park. Can't go, can't go, can't go. Can't even go to Chick-fil-A. Now watch. If we believe as our culture would have us, That in those things, that's where true blessedness lies. We'll find ourselves thinking we are something less than blessed. Now pay close attention to this. This may be the best thing I say all morning. Thoughts produce feelings. Feelings affect Actions. 
if we buy into what our culture is selling, we'll be discouraged, frustrated, and then in our actions towards our loved ones and those that surround us, something less than encouraging. How you think shapes how you feel. How you feel has a strong influence on how you behave. However, if we, like Jesus, believe that blessedness is simply found in doing the Father's will, is there anything right now that's standing in your way of being blessed? Is there anything right now that's stopping you from doing kingdom work? Is there anything that's hindering you right now from prioritizing God, His Word, His work? I'll go one step further. If anything, I'd argue, our present circumstances have actually freed many of us from ensnaring worldly attachments and have provided us with a new and fresh opportunity that is greater than what we had before to do God's work. And if this is how we think, I have an enhanced opportunity to do God's work, then guess how we'll feel? Pretty excited. And if we're feeling pretty excited, then guess how we'll likely behave? That's right. Pretty good. Kind of reminds me of Jesus' upside down explanation to the disciples in John chapter 4. They thought blessedness came from eating lunch. Jesus remained at the well, ministered to a woman whose life was completely broken by sin. When they came back, how did Jesus respond to the disciples? He said something like this I have meat to eat that you know not of. Jesus knew that true blessedness, it didn't come from a Big Mac. It came from doing the Father's will, from plundering Satan's kingdom. Having considered his response to those who slandered him, let's now take a look at those who were unpersuaded by him. So number two, those who were unpersuaded by him. We're going to look at this response. It's verse 29 through 36. Let's hasten. Verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, Jesus is answering those who were unpersuaded by him, and we know that from what he says in verse 29 and 30, because he brings back this whole thought of those who are demanding for a sign, those who are wanting more miracles, more proof, more light, more evidence. And I want you to see that his response to those who are unpersuaded has three parts as well. It's a threefold response. Rapid fire. First, he tells them, you too, that's T-O-O, you too are evil. That's what he says. You too are evil. Look at verse 29. This generation is an evil generation. Why? It seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Do you see that from Jesus' perspective, everything is pretty black and white? You're either for him or you're against him. You're either gathering with him or you're seeking to scatter what he has come to claim. We live in a world that creates a third category. We like to make room for the undecideds who, from our perspective, aren't, quote, evil like the slanderers, right? Nor are they, quote, good, like the followers, correct? They're somewhere in between. 
Jesus, in this teaching, destroys this human tendency. Jesus labels these individuals as also being evil. So Jesus says first that they too are evil, for they have rejected the clear signs that God has already given in sending the greater than Jonah prophet, the Lord Jesus himself, and his preaching ministry. But notice, secondly, he tells them that they too will be condemned. And I want you to see, this is a very merciful thing for Jesus to do because in confronting them and rebuking them, there's a sense in which he's extending mercy and he's calling these people to repent. He's calling them to see. He's calling them to change their standing, to choose a different side. Notice, so first he says, you too are evil. Secondly, he says, you too are evil will be condemned. Look at the rationale of verse 31 and 32. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and, look at this phrase, condemn them. This is a reference to the queen of Sheba, who in the time of Solomon resided on the continent of Africa and had merely heard by way of trade and travel of the unparalleled wisdom of this Israelite king named Solomon who traveled a far journey at great cost to interact with Solomon, to learn of him and his God. And we're being told here that the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The thought process is this. One day at the great judgment day, those people who, they didn't slander Jesus, but rather remain unpersuaded by Jesus, rationalizing by demanding, well, I need more evidence, I need more proof. Rejecting the evidence and proof that God had graciously provided. These people will be condemned by the likes of the Queen of Sheba, by the likes of the people of Nineveh, verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at that judgment with this generation and, look at this, condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So who is Jesus? He's the one who is greater than Solomon. Who is Jesus? He's the one that is greater than Jonah. On that great judgment day, hear me, those who received less light than us, by us I'm referring to those who lived in the first century and beyond, those who have seen the light of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We will be testified against and we will be caused to see that our problem was not that we didn't have enough light. Our problem was rather our lack of sight. Our lack of sight. This is where Jesus goes next in his answer. He tells them, you too are evil. He says to them, you too will be condemned. And then notice thirdly and finally, in the second response that we're looking at, he says to them, your problem is not a lack of light, but rather a lack of sight. Your problem is not a lack of light. You don't need more signs. Your problem is, and this whole concept of a bad eye is very similar to the concept of having a bad heart. Your, your problem is your unwillingness to see what I have clearly revealed. Your unwillingness to believe what I have clearly made known. Your unwillingness to submit to what truth you actively suppress in your heart. Look at verse 33. No one after lighting a lamp puts it on a cellar or under a basket but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. What Jesus is saying is that He has shined and He has shined or emitted light revealing who God is and what God desires, the way to truly be blessed. He's done this for all the world to see. So therefore, their problem was not a lack of light, but rather that they had bad eyes. 
Now look at this in verse 34 and 35. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. In summary, to those who were unpersuaded by Him, who refused to repent, demanding more signs, Jesus states, you aren't blessed. Rather, you are cursed or condemned. The blessed are the repentant community. The blessed are those who have seen Jesus as the messenger mightier than John the Baptist, as the prophet greater than Jonah, both in his preaching and in his resurrection, as the sage wiser than Solomon in his teachings and mastery of Torah. True blessedness is found by recognizing that all the types and shadows of Scripture point to and find their telos in Jesus. As the Son, He is the true representative of the Father. All who see Him as such and respond to His call to repentance are and will be eternally blessed. All right, so let's pause for a minute. Those at home, wake back up. Look this way. All right, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me today? Well, what I'm wanting you to do this morning, I want you to examine your thinking. Has, has our right side up kingdom, this world, has it seduced you into thinking that a rising stock market is necessary to be blessed? Or have, have you lived too long in self-deception, believing that another sporting event and success for your team this season will cause you to be flourishing? Has all the fear-mongering of our media tricked you into thinking that the only hope for security is found in a vaccine or some effective treatment for COVID-19? That will provide you with the peace that you ultimately crave for you and your family. If so, it's likely that right now your spirit is being crushed. It's possible that you are feeling more cursed than blessed. Your thinking is affecting your feelings, and your feelings, again, are fueling your behaviors. Friend, don't you see? If blessedness, according to the upside-down kingdom, is really found in seeing Christ as the truly great one, if flourishing comes merely through seeing Him as the one who brings about the eternal celestial kingdom, if being truly blessed is really a matter of having been given eyes to see the light of Jesus Christ, then are you truly blessed today, Christian? Yes! Regardless of the circumstances around you, you are convinced I am blessed because I belong to Jesus. And if you think you're blessed, you will feel you're blessed. And if you feel you're blessed, you make a whole lot better of a spouse. A whole lot better of a temporary homeschooling parent. A whole lot better of an increasingly poor American. And by the way, throwing this in as bonus for the few that are still awake and paying attention, what has been the usual circumstances of the blessed this side of eternity? Think about that for a minute. Right? What I'm saying is, that the believing remnant has always been perceived by the world to be not blessed, but yet in reality, they're the ones that are truly blessed. And I want you to think for a moment what have been the conditions of the people of God throughout 
the aeons. Something less than what this world thinks are necessary conditions for being blessed. The church, the majority of the time, has been a persecuted and afflicted people. Friend, your mindset towards adversity ought to be a little bit like Br'er Rabbit. Please, sir, please, sir, whatever you do, don't throw me in the briar patch, a.k.a. circumstances of suffering. Knowing deep within that the briar patch has long been the familiar home for the people of God and an excellent place to demonstrate that God alone is the true source of human flourishing. So we've listened to the first two responses, his response to those who slandered him and his response to those who demanded of him a sign. Finally, let's now look at his response to the one who marveled. Number three, his response to the one who marveled. I want you to notice that I think this comes right in the center of the text. And kind of like in a chiastic structure, the center of the text, I think here is functioning as the focal point. Notice what happens. And if you're reading it, it kind of seems unrelated if you forget that some initially marveled. But notice, we find one woman who has marveled. And notice what she says. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. Did you know she was from the South? She was from the South. What does Jesus say to this woman? To this one who's part of the marveling crowd? What does Jesus say to her? Real quickly, two things. One, he rejects her suggestion that blessedness comes by way of genetic relation. Right? And, and many a parent might entertain this thought that true success is found in the success of your adult children. So this woman, believing Jesus to be someone special, just for a moment out loud expresses, it must be an amazing thing. It must be a real big blessing to be your mama. And praise God for every parent who has a child who brings honor to your name. But Jesus rejects this. So, he informs her that blessedness is not a result of genetic relation. And then notice that he corrects her. Notice what he says, verse 28. Blessed rather are those who, and if you're at home, say it with me if you're reading it. Hear the word of God and finish it out. That's right. Keep it. In other words, blessedness. Who is truly blessed? Those who follow him. Who is truly blessed? Blessedness here is the reward given to those who see Jesus as God's great prophet and His words as being God's words themselves and therefore they keep. They hold tightly to. They submit themselves to. They give their energies to follow what Jesus has said. Brother and sister, what I'm saying this morning in the midst of this coronavirus saga is that you can be blessed regardless of your circumstance. You can be blessed if you will simply hear and obey God as He has been revealed to us by His Son through the power of of His Holy Spirit. Let me make this perfectly clear. In God's coming kingdom, the upside down kingdom, it is still those who do not appear to be blessed from our world's perspective that are truly and objectively blessed. The world believes that flourishing will be found so long as we live in denial of God. Jesus Christ, God's Son, proclaims that we will only flourish through union with God and we will only find union with God through His Son. And here's the best news this morning, particularly if you've tuned in today as a guest. Jesus 
is willing to unite to the Father any person who will repent of their sin and will to follow Him. So in conclusion, here's what I'm saying this morning. Christian, who's truly blessed? It's not who you think it is. Stop listening to the world. All they offer is fake news. If you by grace have become one who hears and obeys the Son, then I say, based on the authority of Jesus Christ, you today and all days to come are truly blessed. And if the stock market crashes, guess what? You're still blessed. Praise God. And if COVID-19 infects you and you die, you are still blessed. And if we are quarantined for the rest of our lives, well, that won't be quite very comfortable, but it won't for a moment shake my status of being blessed. How's this so? Because true blessedness is found in Jesus. The right side up kingdom is crumbling, folks. Hallelujah. The right side up kingdom is crumbling and giving way to the upside down king. The first will be the last. The last will be the first. The meek will inherit the earth. In the Father's kingdom, it's those who do not appear to be blessed that are truly blessed. Praise God for how He is at work in our time to help His church rediscover this great truth. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, what a liberating teaching. But God, I stand here in confession. I and my people and this culture, we do not preach this truth to ourselves enough. No matter what chaos characterizes our trip to the grocery store, we are still blessed. May we believe it, feel it, and act upon it because of Christ. No matter what liberties are stripped from us, we are still blessed. May we cling to this. And may we treasure this new opportunity to pursue blessedness as we are given enhanced opportunities to sit at Jesus' feet and to accomplish His kingdom agenda. God, I pray if there's one who up to now has been unpersuaded, God, I pray that they would see the evil nature of their indifference. I pray that they will see that while they're not slandering your name, they are still, they are still in a state of condemnation. But God, I pray that they would hear your merciful invitation to humble themselves and acknowledge the problem is not a lack of light. The problem is not you have hidden yourself from us. The problem is our self-willed eyes do not want to see. And grant that one eyes to see, ears to hear, and a tender heart to believe and follow Jesus so that they too might be blessed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.